Hello and welcome to the Odd Couple Podcast. This is Siddharth here. And I'm Dr. Sheesh. And guys, it's been such a long time since we've put out a show. You guys must be wondering what we were up to. First and foremost, happy, happy new year and hope you guys are having a fabulous year and staying safe from this Omicron virus which is doing the rounds. And also, we've been working on a new show called Beyond the Diagnosis, uh, which is uh, not a typical medical podcast. And do check out our brand new show where Dr. Ashish, along with a good friend of ours, Dr. Viroshni, who are discussing some really fabulous topics. And you'll have the links to the show in our show notes. Today, we have a very exciting guest with us to inaugurate Season 3 of the Odd Couple podcast. We have Sangeeta Santosham. Sangeeta Santosham is a counseling psychologist based out of Chennai. She holds a master's in applied behavioral studies from Oklahoma City University, USA, and a master's of philosophy in psychology from Women's Christian College, Chennai. She has many academic accolades to her credit, including international publications. She is certified in cognitive behavior therapy from Salford Cognitive Therapy Training Center, UK. She has worked and obtained advanced training in counseling and psychotherapy. She's also a versatile and a multilingual vocalist credited with singing a wide range of genres, right from Western classical music, contemporary jazz to Tamil hits. She is one of the very few artists from India formally trained in musical theatre as well. Thank you so much for joining the Odd Couple podcast, Sangeeta. Welcome. Thank you for having me here. This is going to be fun. So welcome, Dr. Sangeeta, and thank you for joining us on Season 3 of the Odd Couple podcast. So, Doc, I think... The new year brings out everybody's new year resolution. And it's usually a time to contemplate on what we have done and what we have not done. And I feel sometimes somewhere along the way, we start feeling like probably didn't achieve what we wanted to. So that's why we wanted to discuss today. Do we really set ourselves up to feel that way that sometimes we're not reaching what we you know wanted to are we setting our goals too high or is it just normal to feel that way i think it depends on our personalities i think some people feel like they've achieved everything they wanted that's on the other side of the spectrum (laughs) and then uh, most of us i think come from uh backgrounds especially like us in the medical field and so on where um achievement is given a lot of importance And so even if we have achieved a lot or we have actually done a lot, you know, checked off a lot of things on our list, we still look at those one or two things which we haven't touched or we haven't done anything about. And then we uh, get upset over that. So I think we do not give ourselves enough credit as human beings and as a culture. We do not give ourselves enough credit for the things that we have done. There is always a tendency to look at the things which are not done, the things which are not complete. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. But we are talking at a stage where, like you doctors or like me, who have reached, let's say, 15, 20 years of work X, we have reached somewhere and we can at least have something to say, hey, at least I achieved this, right? But there are a lot of people who are just starting off their careers or just at the cusp of uh, exploring this world. And there's a constant, what's the right word? There's a constant comparison being made to the peers where who might be earning a little more who have achieved a little more who have done probably use their time more efficiently or probably got into a better college or had their dreams come true uh, at a younger age whereas there are a lot of people who are straddling behind and tend to think themselves as a loser or a failure what do you what do you say to them um when you were talking to me you mentioned the word a couple of times you said compare yes yeah i think every time we do compare ourselves to another person we are going to feel like failures if we are going to look at instagram posts of other people we are going to look like failures and i do get this from a lot of young people i actually have young people sitting in my office and saying i saw my friends instagram post and i felt so insecure i felt like i haven't reached there as yet or so it could be like that person got into this ivy league university or somebody's moved on in life, they've already got married, I'm still not married, or somebody's got a promotion and I'm still starting out, I'm five years behind people in the corporate world and so on. While I do think uh, we cannot be blind to comparison, you need to compare yourself with the other people in your office or in your field to understand what are the possibilities. 
um i think this loser mentality comes because we do compare ourselves very unfairly to other people's lives and i see it not just with young people i see it with older people as well and i think it's coming more with um social media because everybody's putting up their great side uh pictures and this and that and you know that's what i feel i mean a therapist who's probably a little older than me would have a different take on it also because they would have been there at a time when there was no social media and uh would have seen it differently see the way i look at it is i i feel to a certain extent society builds us up and sets us up to fail and if i can just give you a small example I, you talked about marriage but before that you have school you know when we are in school and let's say you get a, a you get a distinction it's not enough you need to get 95 99 right you 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 get to college which college did you get into or oh, you didn't get into that college or oh, not great enough you get to that age of marriage and then they say oh all your friends have got married you are not getting married they put that pressure on you you get married you have a child or you don't have a child and people are like oh you haven't had a child today till now you're getting older then they set that up for you and then you come to the age of 40 where you're working and then you want to be in that one person you know of the guys who've made it you want to be the guy on wall street you want to be that actor you want to be that one person the doctor who's driving a, a bmw or a mercedes but but you don't see the the rest of the people who are there in that same boat as you so i feel it's society which sets us up to fail over there true but who when you mean say society who are these people you're talking about everybody around us just the way we have structured our society right okay all right it starts a lot with our parents it starts a lot with families in fact most people i mean it's been documented and found out and when we study human behavior that people who constantly uh even at an older age keep comparing themselves with others are people who've been compared a lot when they were growing up so it could be cousins it could be other siblings it could be the neighbors kids but you know they've been taught at that very young age that the way you weigh yourself is you look at somebody else and see if they are better than you or worse than you or if they are better than you you always aspire to and we do that in our houses as well right we talk about the neighbors kid who got a 100 or why did you get a 98 yeah so it starts from our houses and then it yeah the school system picks up the same mentality uh and it just goes on and on into uh, other spheres as well but is are there certain types of personalities who are more prone to this you know when we look at different types of personality like type a type b type c people who are you know medically inclined to this can you explain what type a b and c is sorry type a is a very driven personality just to put it short type b is a little more passive and there's a, a a b combination which is a combination of both none of these are very strict in what they are but uh, they've come up with these concept types of personalities there are different ways of uh, describing personalities so most people who come from an asian background like so there's us or chinese or whatever they we all come from backgrounds where comparison is very very strong it's there and then it becomes sort of part of our dna and then we pass it on to the kids and to pass it on to everybody else and i take vocal classes and sometimes there is an urge to tell a student look at her she's done her homework you know what i mean it's it's just there it comes up so we who come from collectivistic societies do go through a lot of comparison people who come from individualistic societies compare themselves a little less because in those societies kids are brought up in a way more individualistic way in the sense that uh, yeah okay so your brother is doing great in this and that's amazing but why don't you try this and you are doing great in something else you know what i mean i wouldn't say there's a clean line between this and that but that is the basic difference between asian cultures and western cultures um so the personality itself in these places develop a little differently and we do give importance to what other people tell us about ourselves about our families about our kids and so that pressure is always there in those communities that pressure is much less not that it's not there it's just much less compared to where we come from so do you think it's 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 a behavior which can be i mean is it is it something which we learn as we grow up so basically like what you were talking about where here we get in our type of culture where probably you know the whole joint family system is 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 bigger than you know the west and um, so over here you're always constantly compared while over there 
they're trying to make you find your passion and work towards your passion. So in those kind of systems where you are more focused on you and your growth, then it's it's a lot more different compared to what we go through. Yeah, there is a lot more difference because the kids grow up with a, a brighter sense of self-esteem. Knowing that, hey, I'm also different from this person. I'm different, but I'm special. She's special. I'm also special. And even their school system is designed in such a way that they give them a holistic development. So it's not just academics. It's not just grades. Uh, they introduce them to music and sport and this and that and carpentry and things like that and make them more uh, self-dependent, independent, and give them a more holistic view of the world. They've been designed like that. We are still catching up. <laughs> we haven't gotten there as yet. Yeah, but also even in let's say an individualistic society, uh, as you mentioned earlier, there's only so much a society can contribute to solving this problem. But I feel the majority of the problem lies within oneself. Because uh, like you earlier, alluding to what you guys were talking earlier about the personality types, and depending on the kind of personality that I am, I view the world very differently Let from, let's say, you or Dr. Ashish. Right, my experiences are very different uh, compared to you. The opportunities that I've had is different. Uh, the kind of privileges that I may or may not have had uh, would be very different. So, let's say if somebody wants to pursue a career, let's say which isn't conventional in India, everybody has to be a doctor, engineer, uh, go to IITs and IINs, and it's a very uh, thing. But somebody who wants to get in the arts especially somebody like you who who is a singer, right? I presume it becomes very hard to only pursue a singing career or an acting career or within the arts, let's say being a painter or an artist without a normal steady income job. So how do you handle that and how do we balance it and how, how should such people uh, view the world that we currently live in? It is difficult to have a full-time job in the arts. That's true, which is why most artists have a day job and then the evening job <laughs> becomes the arts. Ideally, we need to, like you said, we have only this uh, medicine, engineering, medicine, engineering thing going on. If we bring up these kids, at least the next generation, with saying that it's okay not to do medicine, it's okay not to do engineering, it's okay to do what you want to do, then there's a level of confidence which comes into it as well. You look at my peers around me, there are hardly any of them who do full-time music, even if they are very talented. Right when stepping into it itself, there'll be a family member who will sit them down and say, hey, listen, music is not going to put food on your table. You need to have a regular job. Or people uh, who get alliances from uh, a guy who is doing full-time music, they're like, what sort of a job is this? What is his, what is his regular job? <laughs> right. Right. So that individual interest is, we're still a little far away from that. Uh, individual interest is not cultivated, not just by society. People are scared. You know, you're also scared because you don't see anybody else in your life who's so successful as the guy, the, sorry, maybe the guy who runs an engineering unit or whatever, who's driving the BMW. You don't see very many musicians like that. There are some who get into a uh, movie field and so on. So, yeah, and the other thing you mentioned about it coming from the inside, this tendency to compare, it is true in a sense that, so there's this guy called um, Alfred Adler, and he did uh, research on siblings. And uh, he said that a lot of high achievers, right, people who are high achievers in society, they are actually high achievers because they have a sense of insecurity about certain skills. And they develop this insecurity in households when kids, are, even if parents don't really compare the kids, they sort of see this other sibling getting attention for something else. And then, you know, they feel like, okay, they need to get attention for something else and so on. And he says that these high achievers you see are actually people who've grown up feeling a little insecure. And to deal with that, they become high achievers in their field. Yeah, they sort of compensate for it. So he says that the high achievers you see in society are people who've actually grown up comparing themselves with people in the house or, uh, or around. And then they think, okay, I need to get there. And they try and find different ways of compensating for that insecurity. 
he came up with the concept of the inferiority complex wow okay yeah so like you said there is a certain part of it which comes from the inside as well so we can't completely say okay it's people at home and the grandparents and the neighbors who are asking about the kids marks and this and that i think there is some of it which comes right from the inside but this level of comparison which we make with others isn't it also a good thing in a certain way because it drives you to do more and make you achieve stuff yeah so that's the good and the bad of it right there are good things so it's good if it makes you it drives you makes you achieve stuff and at the end of the achievement if you give yourself a pat on the back and say hey that's good you've come a long way then that's good but if you achieve something and then you still look at yourself as oh no i haven't done anything look at that person look at this person look at that person then you you are making your own life miserable and pessimistic no i think me and sid have talked about this before the way we look at at achieving something like for me it's like i need to constantly see what i need to do next like forget about the big arch i need to know what those small steps are so okay i need to do this and once i do this it gets me there and once i get there then i say what do i do next and then so i'm constantly looking to get to the next thing and then once i get there i'm always trying to see what do i do next so there's that constant thing of pushing myself as compared to say who doesn't think of these things and just you know flows with uh, life the way it is i think what i'm trying to ask you is we see things very differently but do we f- find that at certain points that this is detrimental to our health when we start uh, you know constantly putting it looking for something so we're not really finding happiness in achieving that small step but we always aiming so sometimes we're just not enjoying the those small moments which we should you know so just what did i wanted to ask you are you enjoying that process when you get to one step and you are looking at the other step are you enjoying the process of doing that yeah i enjoyed for a short while and then i'm like okay i need to do something else now i'm bored of it <laughs> so it's <laughs> so it it really comes down to what uh makes you happy per se there are people who get completely so involved in achieving things and going forward and going forward that they lose out and on like you said like uh the smaller more meaningful things in life maybe spending time with family maybe just putting your leg up in the evening and listening to music maybe just having a good time with friends sometimes those things take a back seat to this drive to move forward and then definitely it is detrimental so it really depends on the individual if you're able to bring in a sort of balance where you are moving forward you are giving yourself a lot of positivity at the same time you are able to pay attention and to the finer things in life to the things which actually mean a lot at the end of the day and then if that balance is achieved then what are you looking for i mean i completely agree with you dr sangeeta i think it's all about balance or the fine balance that we talk about before we delve more into that we'll take a quick break and be right back you're listening to the old couple podcast old couple podcast a pandemia inc production are you ready a friendly fireside chat with friends where no topic is beyond a healthy discussion punctuated with a laugh or two check it out Tune in every fortnight on your favorite podcast network. And welcome back to the Odd Couple Podcast, the first episode of season three with Dr. Sangeeta Santosham, where we've been exploring why do we sometimes feel like a loser and how do we navigate that towards a slightly less state of mind of failure. So, Dr. Sangeeta, well, like Dr. Ashish mentioned, that he looks at the minute steps and everything. and is looking to enjoy those and trying to see how it is and and in his field he is a super achiever from my eyes right and i'm sure everybody will agree but my issue is slightly different and i don't see it as an issue but probably i'm too laid back i don't consider myself ambitious i don't consider myself anything but probably what helped me out was that very early on in life i resigned to the fact that i have certain limitations which is limitations of siddhat this is what i can do i can't get 100 in math i can i will never get 100 in hindi right <laughs> i will never be the fastest kid on the race track but i had certain skills which i was slightly better at and that's probably something which i'm exploring right now with this podcast with dr ashish but 
my question to you is like a lot of people, I mean, that's the solution which I found personally for myself. How do you, how would you probably tell people how they can navigate a similar conundrum that they're going through? I think what you've said is, uh, is superb because that's the way we work with people most of the time to enable people to focus on their positives and figure out, okay, this is not what, this is not my cup of tea. It's not going to work for me. But what are the things which will work for me? What are the things which do go well for me? What are the things that I'm good at? What are the things that I enjoy? Some things I may not be good at, but I might enjoy, like playing sport, playing a sport. So I'm going to make time during the day to play that particular sport just because I enjoy it. Right. So I think that is a good way to move forward. Okay. If you think you thinking you are laid back is different from other people thinking you're laid back. If other people thinking, oh, you're all laid back, you're lazy. I mean, I hear this from parents all the time. The child may not think that way. But uh, that's what makes us adults, right? We come up with our own ways of looking at ourselves. But I think, Sid, you're, you're very, very mature in that way where you are able to say that, you know, this is what I can do and this is what I can't do. Let me focus on this. And, and then you have me who says that, okay, you know what? I can do anything and I'm going to give it a shot. You know, whether I make it or not, I'm going to try. So that's my look at it. But I think the problem lies with the person who doesn't realize both of us and who's just churning through, doesn't know what his limitations are, doesn't really know what his ambitions are, but the world is moving on all around him. And then they start getting put into this bubble. So do we find that these these kind of people, which I'm talking about, the third type of people who I'm talking about, is there a dark path which they take into depression and stuff like that? Do you see that? I think it depends on the age. When I see younger people, they still know that they feel that the, the road is open and there are so many things to explore. And the choices which they have are much, much more than what we would have had growing up at that age. Entering into a workplace when you're 21 and the kind of money you make, the kind of options which are there and so on. So in my experience, I've seen this with particular kind of people, okay? I do see it with people who are 35 plus, who have been in a career because they've been asked to be in a career or they've been in a path because everybody said you should be in it or they thought, okay, I don't know what else to do. So I'm here. And then they get to that, what we, what we can call it a midlife crisis. We can call it whatever we want. They get to that point where they are somewhere between 35 and 40 and they realize that a big part of their life is gone and they are still sort of looking for themselves. So I do see this with them. I do see this sort of, like you said, churning, not here, not there, sort of going around with people who are have very high IQ and not just IQ, people who are sometimes jack of all trades. They do so many things. They're so good at so many things and they just don't know which one to pick. And I see this with 20, 21 year olds who um, come in. I've also seen it with people who are between 35 and 40. They have, these are basically they're trying to find themselves. And the others say, at least so like he said, okay, I know that this is what I am. I have my limitations. I'm this kind of person. So uh, so that might say, I know this is the kind of person I am. I, I'm all out to achieve. I'm all out to get a name. I'm all out to put myself out there. At least these are aspects you all are sure of, you know. But there are people who come in who are not even sure of that. And they're still looking for themselves. But like you rightly said, that 35 to 40 is when you're at that precipice of, like what Sid said, you've got that 10 or 20 years of uh, experience behind you and now you've climbed the mountain halfway through and then you're you're finding out that the, the, the rest of the journey is far more difficult and sometimes it's, it's not just whether you're really good at it, there are other circumstances which are required to push you to that, to the peak of the mountain and, and you, you get disheartened, you know, across the way. So I think that is the point which I feel like people really need help with and, you know, explaining um, how to deal with that, that that last push, the last mile to get to that one person of the thing. Yeah. Sometimes they need to, like I said, just they need to figure out who they are at that point, somewhere between 35 and 40. Something which generally happens at the end of uh, adolescence sometimes happens here. Uh, and uh, pushing them forward really depends on what they want because there are some people who get to that age and completely abandon corporate life and they say, this is not for me. I'm going to go stay in Audible. I've had enough of this. Yeah, but isn't it just okay? Isn't it just all right? I mean, we all have parents and how many of our parents are presidents? How many of our parents are, you know, the, the tip of the pay? But life went on well for them. They're happy. 
they brought you into this world. They've made something out of you. You've come halfway through the thing. So isn't it just okay? And sometimes isn't it just fine for them to just know that it's all right. You don't have to be that 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 superstar, you know. Life is just fine just the way it is. Yeah. And we are all superstars in our own way. If I, we all look at our own lives, we would have all achieved. Achieving in the eyes of the other people is different. But we've come across our own barriers. We've gone across them. We've learned stuff. We've changed as human beings over the years. We are all superheroes in our own way. We are looking for is, you know, for us to climb that Mount Everest and the name to come in the newspaper. We have all walked our own personal Mount Everest. There are people who come out of addictions. There are people who've gotten out of bad marriages, gotten into good marriages. People who, you know, who people, I have people who sometimes come in who can't speak in corporate circles because they're not confident and they go through therapy and speech therapy and so on. And now they're able to make presentations. These are all small things in the eyes of the world. But for that particular person, it's a lot. And we've all achieved those kind of things. It's just that it's not come in the newspapers. Our names haven't been flashed. <laughs> right. No, no, I completely agree because it's a great point that you make. We are all superstars, right, individually. And we just don't see ourselves that way. But somebody else sees us as a superstar. While it is bad to compare, but you are also being compared. You're one of the categories that somebody else is comparing with you and like, oh my God, look how much Sangeeta has achieved or look how much Siddharth has achieved. So in somebody's eyes, you are better than them or probably worse than them. That's fine. That's just uh, human nature. But another thing which I wanted to ask you was going back to what Ashish briefly touched upon, the younger generation who are in their 20s and going on to 30s, just started off the career. As you rightly said, they have far more or wider opportunities to choose from, kind of skill sets and other things. But I also feel that they're spoiled for choice. It is easier for us saying, okay, engineering doctor, end of story, or become an accountant, chartered accountant, or one of these 10 things, five things that we had. Now these guys have about 30 things to choose from. They are absolutely confused, which means that they don't stick long at a particular job which has a detrimental effect because they don't they would they start taking too many sabbaticals i've been guilty of taking a sabbatical and i know how hard it was to get back into the workspace but i see these younger folks taking sabbaticals within one year of working and i'm like uh, what happened they're like no 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 i want to travel and see the world i'm like very well and good but they end up doing that for 3 years and they expect to come back and get paid Equal to somebody who's gained extra four years during that time. So what's your take on that? Uh, yeah, I think every generation, like the Bible says, every generation comes with a curse. <laughs> and I think a younger generation is a choices. Yes, they do have a lot of choice. And uh, just like any young person and how we were all when we were at that age entering our careers, there's not a lot of foresight. There's a lot we can't see about the future. We just do what our peers are doing or what we think is the cool thing to do at that point of time. And that is going to be something that they will deal with as they grow. Right. And it's like, yeah, also cell phones. We didn't have that distraction. They, they do. That, that takes me to my next question, which we briefly touched upon earlier about social media. There's a lot of people who are probably not earning that much, but they're faking it so much online right, right, and right. making everybody jealous or or feel like a loser. Probably they just went to, I mean, round the corner, which had a nice house and they take a picture in front of a Mercedes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I keep doing with you, Sid. <laughs> oh, I'm the Mercedes, Ashish. <laughs> yeah. So like I was saying, if you could throw some more light on the whole, how much social media adds on to this anxiety and this whole I'm a failure kind of a zone that people tend to get into. How can they combat that? And and through what lenses should they look into it? Social media is definitely a huge source of anxiety. It adds on to anything that you're already feeling. If you're feeling insecure to have your uh, friend has got gotten into this huge university somewhere in Harvard or something, social media is going to make it even worse. Because social media will actually show you pictures of Harvard even if you're not looking for it. Right? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's going to show it to you. Sometimes there are conversations I have at home and then how does a cell phone know this that I was talking about? It? Yeah, so definitely, yes. I think um, a couple of ways of looking at it. One is that, yes, we need to develop our own sense of self-worth 
so that we uh, don't feel so inadequate when we see somebody else. Like Asha said, feeling a little bit of inadequacy to push you to achieve is okay. But feeling it to such an extent that it brings you down completely, there are people who actually go through anxiety and depression just comparing themselves with others. That's not a great place to be in. So you develop your own sense of positive self-worth so that it doesn't affect you. In certain cases, we need to get, like with my clients and patients, get people completely off social media because it just makes things worse. Anybody going through an emotional problem, say somebody is going through a divorce or somebody is going through something else at home, sometimes we need to get them completely out of social media and give it, give the social media a sort of a sabbatical. Give yourself six months. Get yourself off it. Yeah, so if at all take a sabbatical, take a sabbatical from social media. Yes, and it actually works. It actually works. Your brain has more time to focus on things which are important. It sort of quietens down. The anxiety level comes down. There's more time for you to reflect on things which are important for you. And there's more time to do things which are important for you. It actually does work. So social media, yes. Like I said, that's the bane of this generation. So I have a follow-up question. So one is, obviously, there's comparison, and then there's social media, then there's your the person that you are, and the society, right? These are the few prongs of this problem. But there's also, there are a lot of people who I know who probably don't, they're good at certain things, but they don't do it because of fear of failure, right? So they have this immense fear of failure, and they're just like, no, 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 I, I won't touch that. I'm good at it, but... I don't want to fail. They just want a sure shot to success. How to counter that? Because I see that a lot. That fear of failure basically comes from high anxiety only. Fear of, uh, oh, what if I fail? What if something goes wrong? What if I'm, if this goes wrong, that will go wrong. What do people think of me? What do people say about me? And yeah, it basically comes from high anxiety. Uh, with each person, we need to work on what exactly are they afraid of. Mm. Is it just the fact that what if this happens, this happens, this happens? Or does this have a deeper meaning for you? And if you do fail, so what? What's the worst that can happen if you fail? And how do we deal with that? To look at it from that perspective. And what if you don't fail? What happens then? You know, look at it from different perspectives so that you get a more realistic view of it because we can get caught up in that sense of failure and not look at the fact that there might be other things to it than what you're just looking at all the time. So look at the same, whatever you're looking at, maybe it's a business venture or whatever. Look at it from different perspectives. If I fail, so what? If I don't fail, what's going to happen? Correct. I think somebody said that, you know, the guy who fails is the guy who goes on and teaches and the guy who doesn't fail is the guy who goes on and leads. At the end of the day, the two sides to looking at it is just how you look at it, you know, and sometimes it's just not wrong to to really fail. I mean, you fall down, you just learn to pick yourself up in the words of Alfred. And you find your own way to move forward also, your own innovative way to move forward. But do you find that once you become like 50, 55, 60, you kind of accept that you know, I don't need that constant approval from people or the constant uh, congratulations from people. And you are, you resolve to the fact that, you know, I'm fine. I'm okay. Do you see that this is a process of our growth? Like it is something which as we're growing, we're evolving and there comes a stage where we evolve to the point where we say the outside influence on me is not as important as me being happy with myself. Yeah, that's true. But it doesn't really necessarily need to come out in your 60s and 70s. It can come out even before that. And uh, you will see people in their 40s doing the same thing as well. And you will also see people later on in life who are very content with where they are. So basically, it's not really time specific. It's just more of... Yeah, it's more in terms of how you self-actualize and the speed at which you're self-actualizing. The earlier people find it, that sort of satisfaction within the self and not looking for it outside, the happier they are in their old age. So like the bitter uncles and aunties you see are people who are not. I know a few. (laughs) (laughs) Or you get really old and you have nobody to compare with. Your peers are no longer there. (laughs) That's kind of dark, but yeah. So it's always good to get there a little earlier and know that, hey, this is who I am. Nice. So Dr. Sangeeta, another question which I have is, when is the right time to seek professional help from professionals like you because I think majority is it's a personal fight right it's a lot of things that I need to figure out that I need to do yes I can reach out to my support systems like good friends families colleagues xyz but when will be a good time to reach out to a professional like you to help me through that process like I said like you said it yourself 
the best time to reach out is when you know you're not able to answer those questions for yourself and when you are not able to find solutions for those problems yourself. Like you said, it's coming from the inside. You can talk to other people, but ultimately these decisions are yours. And when you feel confused, then that's a very good time to reach out. I always tell people, people especially now, since there's so much of openness to going in and talking to a therapist or a psychologist or even a school counselor, uh, I ask people to reach out even before that. So I ask people to reach out on a very regular basis just to do a check-in with a mental health professional. Say, hey, I just wanted to come in today and you know talk about this and talk about that because those individuals will catch you before you slip into depression. Say sometimes we have clients who walk in with a very severe depression because of say a midlife crisis or a job change and so on. We need to put them on uh, medication, make them feel a little okay about themselves before we start delving into these kind of topics, which are deeper, because at that point of time, there is no way of rationally looking at things. But if we have uh, systems in place where people can do a check in every three months, just to go have a chat with a mental health professional, small little things like that, those people will be trained to catch it even before you go into it. But I think that's the fear, no, that, you know, you go in with a small problem and meet a psychologist. And after that, you come back with a big problem and then <laughs> you feel even worse. <laughs> well, if you want to move ahead, you'll resolve that problem also. <laughs> but things are changing, changing very drastically because I, I see a lot of young people very open to just coming in and talking. They're very open to just coming in and there are corporates who give it for free. I remember about this about six, seven years back. One dude walked in and he was like, this was for free. I just want to check it out and see what it is. So I came. I was like, okay, that's a good place to start. Is there anything you want to talk about? So it's changing. It's changing. So it will it will get better. So Dr. Sagi, the other question which I have is the last question is for professionals like you, you're not immune to such human fallacies, right? So do you also reach out to take professional help when you have such issues or you're already equipped with all the information that so you do it by yourself? Like you said, we are all humans at the end of the day. In fact, the way you operate abroad is every a month or so you need to go into another therapist it's compulsory if you're a therapist you need to go into another therapist you need to actually log it in into the places you're working we don't have that system in india but mm. uh, most of us do reach out for help to other professionals and like i said it's not just when we're going through something but there are there's this, there are institutions here i know which i work with on a different level where I have seen that the people who run it make sure that once in two months or three months that there is a peer counseling going on where somebody meets another senior person just for a chat, just to see if everything is okay and so on. Then that's a good system. Yeah, because it must be really, really taxing to keep hearing problems and issues day in and day out. And I'm sure it'll creep into your personal space sometimes. And it's great to hear that the system exists so that you're at the best to give any kind of help that your patients or whoever's coming to you for help. That's nice. So thank you so much, Dr. Sangeeta, for throwing a lot of light and more, more importantly, clarifying that, hey, you know what? We are not losers and everybody has an opportunity to become a better version of themselves. But stop comparing, stop, stay away from social media, be the best you are. All of us are superstars and keep conversing with your support group and if need be, take the professional help and we'll all get there. It's not the end of the world and it's okay to fail. It's okay not to achieve, keep achieving or super achieving all the time. So thank you so much, Dr. Sangeeta, for joining us on the Odd Couple podcast and uh, especially for the first show of season three. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And thank you, audience, for tuning in to us for season three. Please join us and um, like and subscribe to the show. Please check us out on Twitter, Instagram. Dr. Sangeeta's link in bio will be there in the show notes. So do check her out also. Uh, until the next time, this is Dr. Sheesh signing out. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.